Welcome to the final episode of A Gamer's Guide to Feminism. In some ways, it was the most difficult to write. In gaming, and in many other places, whenever you suggest things that sound like change, people attack your motivations. During this process, I've been accused of some pretty nasty stuff. But it didn't come mostly from gamers. It was from activists who insisted on using gaming as a battleground for larger political agendas. This series wasn't for them. It was for you guys, my fellow gamers. I discovered video games in an arcade in 1981. I was three years old, and my mother lifted me up so that I could reach the stick on the arcade console. That game was Pac-Man, a game designed specifically to appeal to women. Okay, when I was three, I didn't call it Pac-Man. I called it Bucka Bucka. But it's still one of the greatest things ever. I want to do for others what my mother did for me. I want to help women reach those video game controls. I don't care whether my ideas conform to political orthodoxy or trendy buzzwords. I care about facts, and I care about being effective. If what we'd done to this point was working, then we wouldn't be fighting so viciously with each other about this issue of women in gaming. So this leads me to believe that we need to change our approach. There's been a lot of screaming about this issue, but screaming doesn't solve problems. In order to truly improve anything involving inclusion in the video game community, we first need to cut through the political tactics by denying the opportunist places to hide under otherwise innocent behavior. Gamers are easy targets for the political classes, because gamers are seen to be white, heterosexual, cisgendered men, but we're also seen as low-status white, heterosexual, cisgendered men. That means that gamers are people that all political fringes can pick on with impunity. No one's gonna come to the defense of a group branded misogynist neckbeards. Well, I'm a gamer, so I call BS on that. This gamers are white guys assumption? It's gotta stop. We can't advocate for greater inclusion in gaming if the definition of gamer is inherently exclusionary. Black gamer, girl gamer, gay gamer, why do we need these extra terms? If you enjoy video games, you're a gamer. Your race, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity shouldn't come into it. Collectively, we need to stop perpetuating the idea that gamers who are not white, straight, cisgendered men are some kind of other. Gaming since 1981, right here. I'm OG, original gamer. I actually played that ET game. I game through the crash. I experienced firsthand the mind-blowing paradigm shift that came with the original Resident Evil. I remember what it was like to only be able to afford a few games a year, so you had to choose very, very carefully. So when someone talks about gamers automatically being men, I immediately question how much they really know about gamers. But because I am a gamer, I've had hundreds, possibly thousands of conversations with gamers who are male, and the common refrain isn't that they have any problem with women. They have a problem with people who think gamers are the problem. Because women are treated as outsiders, those critics often take the female form. No one can expect gamers to get on board with even small amounts of change if they feel demonized or remarginalized. The association between the gamer identity and privilege is a self-defeating tactic. Keep in mind that punching up is still punching, and whenever you punch, it hurts. Hurt people don't tend to be open to compromise and change. It's very hard to convince someone to treat others like human beings when they themselves don't feel like they're being treated like a human being. Now, ease up, activist types. I'm not trying to take away your right to protest. It's just that there's a time to protest and a time to have conversations, and you can't do those things at the same time. Gamers are sponges for information, but because choice is an inherent part of gaming, we rebel when we feel like we're being told what to think. And this tired old line that it's okay to like things that have problematic elements. What? That's like saying it's okay to be an asshole as long as you know you're being an asshole. No, it's not. People don't want to like things that are being called racist, sexist, homophobic, or transphobic when we're pretending to be heroes. This statement, which was probably intended to give gamers a pass on continuing to enjoy games, just ended up offending everybody. Gamers really aren't some different species. We're people who just don't tend to fit in other places. Instead of focusing on differences, appeal to gamers based on common experiences. We all want the same thing from gaming, a place where the suck of the rest of the world takes a damn break. When you start talking to gamers about privilege, we feel like we're being told life's been handed to us on a silver platter. And that doesn't match our experiences of being bullied, ostracized, and in some cases, marginalized because of physical or mental health conditions, neuroatypicality, or profound introversion. What's been lost in these punching up tactics is that 
you can't know a stranger's suffering. Gamers haven't been shown very many examples of kindness or the benefit of the doubt. So when you start adding more to our plates that sounds like more rejection, you're going to get blowback because of the simple fact that a lot of gamers are flat out tired of being picked on. Empathy is best applied when you lead by example, so that's why I decided to just present the facts and provide a guide, as opposed to starting by focusing on specific games using terms and theories that people may not really understand. I believe that the fundamental question that feminists need to answer for gamers is, why should we care about you when no one cares about us? Totally fair question. At least in my case, I do care about gamers because I am one. And that's what I found gamers want as a starting point. Because of the historical origins of feminism, because of the way we've had to defy gender to promote dignity for our gender, caring often hasn't been a big part of the equation. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to the dork side. That's why it was important for gamers to understand that the dork side is a part of feminism, but it isn't all of feminism. Feminism can't be like the Borg looking to assimilate people. Modern feminism needs to, first and foremost, promote information and encourage dialogue in the gaming community. It's an interactive medium, after all. And I can already hear the howl starting again in the activist classes. Liana, you're victim blaming. You're making this harder. No. Advocacy is about getting a message to stick, and a meaningful message hasn't been sticking. So you have a choice here. Do you want to show your moral superiority, or do you want to be effective? If you want to be effective, it involves just as much listening as it involves talking. Lecturing people when they're trying to have fun just doesn't work. The issue isn't about changing gaming from the outside. It's about strengthening the best parts of gaming that already exist. The desire to engage in choice-driven narratives from a place of understanding and agency. From the conversations I've had, feminists in gaming have failed to effectively answer another fair and fundamental question. Why the hell should we care if women play video games when nothing seems to be stopping them from buying a console? The answer, in fact, is pretty simple. Retail prices of games aren't rising as quickly as production costs, so high-end games have to sell more and more copies to continue to be profitable. Well, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a hobby being a guy thing. That essential sales growth is likely going to come from women since the male consumer base for games is far more saturated. So gamers have a choice too. More women playing games or more in-app purchases in games that feel unfinished because they're trying to suck more money out of each existing player. And this is me, hoping that was an easy decision for you. If you hate women more than microtransactions, I cannot help whatever is wrong with you. And there are more business concerns. Women are 40% of the people who actually buy games. Women also make 70 to 80% of overall household purchasing decisions. That means that many men won't buy things if their partners don't like them. When women have a better opinion of games, men also get to play more video games. Everybody wins! And seriously, aren't you sick of non-gamers treating every video game like it's Grand Theft Auto? Yes, Grand Theft Auto games sell very well. So does Minecraft. The best-selling game of all time is Tetris. Gaming isn't defined by a single franchise. The flip side of the business numbers is that right now the number of female enthusiast gamers, otherwise known as hardcore gamers, is fairly small. I'm not going to try to sell that 41% of gamers are women statistic because the issues we're concerned with here don't include people playing Candy Crush Saga on their phones. We're talking about women who identify as gamers and who have informed opinions about AAA games and the industry at large. And this brings us to the depictions of women within the gaming industry and the narrative surrounding us. I call this trope the trophy victim. Women are being used as trophies in the gaming industry to show what sensitive supportive guys the men around them are. How do you spot a gaming trophy victim? Take all the qualities of your traditional trophy bride, imagine the exact opposite, and you have the perfect female victim of harassment in video games. Brunette, flat-chested, non-sexual, shy, vulnerable, and preferably overweight. And the very fact that we put morality on a woman's wake just shows how messed up this whole thing is. There's a very narrow range of the acceptable types of women who are allowed opportunities in gaming because gaming's trophy victims have to be demure, likable, non-threatening, and not overtly sexual. Because if a woman is the slightest bit interesting, she isn't perfectly passive. 
you may have noticed that there's a visceral reaction from gamers when someone wallows in victimhood. Not because gamers are bullies, but because gamers are the victims of bullying themselves. The strong reactions are a self-defensive instinct, the desire to reject victimhood to avoid perpetuating it. That's important to understand. Gamers' role models are fighters. We're the ones saving the innocent. We don't respond well to whimpering. It's too much like real life. This is where society's expectations of women clash with fundamental parts of the gamer identity. The traditional feminine qualities, passivity, indirection, agreeableness, even in association with pacifism, come into direct conflict with the active, assertive underpinnings of the gamer philosophy of get good. I wanted to make gamers aware of some of the struggles of the first and second waves of feminism because a lot of them had to do with false perceptions of what was natural for women to want to do. At one point, it was seen as natural for women to not want to vote. Then it was natural for women to want to be stay-at-home moms. We know today that both of these assumptions are false for large numbers of women, and I believe that the idea that female gamers aren't normal is an equally arbitrary social stereotype. I'd love to live in a world where being a leader meant you could be agreeable and get along with everyone. We just don't live in that world, and I won't apologize for wanting to smash bad guys. That may not be a normal urge for the ideal woman, but it's normal for me. I reject the idea that my idea of normal is somehow unnatural. But I hear that it is, all the time, even from other women. And this speaks to a powerful truth about why there aren't more women working and playing and gaming. People around us treat us like we're freaks. It's important to be aware that what appears to be self-selection may in fact be responses to strong, persistent social conditioning. What women want varies from woman to woman, but you wouldn't know that based on the current dialogue. To get more women invested in video games as a hobby, we need to work against the strong negative social conditioning coming from outside gaming. And that's hard to do when there are a lot of negatives coming out of the gaming press itself. The enthusiast gaming press spends less time promoting women's projects than it does promoting a narrative about women. And that narrative has been that women are targets of the cruelty of villains and they need male gamers to save them. Yeah, you notice I'm not saying us this time, because I don't want any part of this. Harassment on the internet isn't unique to video games. Hell, the most recent headline-grabbing case of Twitter harassment was against Leslie Jones, an actress in a movie. Female sports reporters face serious on-the-job harassment, as do female news reporters. And we all know the infamous case of Gian Gomeshi, the faux leftist entertainment personality who apologized for sexually inappropriate behavior against a female employee to avoid a second trial. And just because you hear more about the harassment of women, it doesn't mean that men aren't also harassed. It happens less often because there are fewer women in positions of real power, but it does happen. Some feminists ignore or deny these statistics because they feel that it takes away from the fight against the power imbalances that result in women being the majority of sexual harassment cases. But is this an effective way of dealing with the problem, or would a more holistic, consistent approach be more successful? Why can't we just say that harassment of anyone is wrong? Wouldn't that be an easier thing to enforce? The idea that threatening a woman is somehow more wrong than threatening a man is a form of what's called benevolent sexism, an attitude towards women that feels favorable, but that actually treats us as weak and in need of men's protection. Playing up harassment of women while downplaying harassment of men is treating women like we need to be protected by men. From words. When things get rough for a guy who writes about games, the expectation is that he puts his head down, rides out the screaming death threats and invasion of his privacy, and gets back to work. When a woman becomes a target, it's grounds for a mass media freakout. Being denied the opportunity to show that we can be as resilient as men in gaming holds women back in an industry where, like it or not, you earn your cred by showing that you're tough. Harassment targeted at anyone needs to be seen as unacceptable. If it's wrong to do something to a particular human being, it's wrong to do to any human being. No exceptions. As long as we treat men and women differently in this regard, women can't be seen as true equals in the workplace because men assume we need their protection. Not only is this really condescending, but it makes the harassment worse. It gives the trolls more attention. It becomes a bigger deal when a woman is a target, so we're higher value targets. Trolls love those model and harassment of women stories. They think they're hilarious. 
But this mixed message regarding acceptable behavior based on gender has another negative impact as well. Gamers are getting confused regarding what behavior is in fact acceptable. I can't even keep track of who is an acceptable target of what insult this week. In talking to other gamers, I frequently hear the question asked, why can a woman say hurtful mean things to me, but I can't do the same thing to her? Why is that equality? It isn't. It's benevolent sexism. So the rules regarding conduct in the gaming community need to be clear, simple, and consistent, and the same for everybody. And there go the activists getting mad at me again. People, this isn't about housing allowances or judicial system failures or real life physical assaults or reproductive rights. I'm with you on that. On those points, being polite, quiet, and patient hasn't gotten the job done, but that's not what we're dealing with here. If you want to go scream at the government or the billionaire class or other controllers of real world systems of oppression, knock yourself out. Gaming doesn't exist in a vacuum that's exempt from those problems, but people use gaming to try to temporarily escape those problems. So bringing your unchecked outrage here is just seen as dropping a turd in the proverbial punch bowl. No matter how you look at it, there's no getting around a very simple fact. Women can't be seen as leaders if we're not given a chance to lead. If we're expected to let men fight our battles as soon as things get tough, we aren't given the opportunity to show what we can do. We can't collectively get used to the realities of leadership where women are concerned, including the reality that leaders make mistakes, if we don't have the opportunity to get used to women in accessible high-profile positions. Yeah, sometimes running your own ship really sucks, and we need the private support of the people around us, providing us with positives, reasons to keep going, that balance out the overwhelming negativity that even comes from other women. But men can't solve these issues on our behalf, because that perpetuates the association between leadership and a male voice. If you're talking for a woman, you're talking instead of a woman. You're denying that woman the opportunity to speak for herself and draw her own praise as well as her own criticism. This doesn't mean that people shouldn't do nice things for the people in their lives. It means that we're right in the way we're expected to treat women. We're wrong about the extra social allowances to treat men like crap. The very same developers that are scolding their players for current behavior have cultivated a trash talk culture that's gone way too far. When you cultivate a mindset of GTFO, what do you expect is going to happen? A certain amount of good natured trash talk in matches isn't harmful, but it's gone way beyond that. Flat out bullying behavior is using trash talk as cover, and some women now even feel the need to out trash talk the guys to prove they fit in. Of course, the guys end up getting hurt, but they don't say anything because they're not supposed to. I'm sure I'm not the only one who doesn't like being around excessive trash talk. Friends should be able to tell friends when they've crossed a line, but that's not happening because gaming culture is all about thick skins and potty mouths. And yet everyone, male or female, seems to have some story about not feeling like they belong. Maybe that's because even your friends are running you down and you've been given the message that you're just supposed to take it. So we've got work to do in the gaming community, but it's all achievable. There are plenty more things that I think the industry could be doing to improve things for women, but I wanted to stick to things gamers have control over. The series is called A Gamer's Guide to Feminism, after all. Hopefully I'll be able to do other series that focus more on things like marketing, hiring, and more industry-related stuff. But for now, let's recap. Here's how we can encourage dialogue as a first step for making female gamers seen as full-fledged gamers. Because we are. Stop associating the gamer identity with inherent privilege. A gamer isn't a white man. A gamer is someone who loves games. Associating the gamer identity with men, others, women. Focus on the similarities between different types of gamers and use empathy, stressing a common desire to belong. Listen, don't lecture. People don't care about your feelings when they think you're attacking them. This goes for everyone. Don't call a woman some horrid name then explain it was because you were somehow rejected by some feminist. We don't care at that point. You acted like a jerk. Recognize that getting more women playing AAA video games isn't a humanitarian cause. It's important for the financial health of the video game industry because the industry needs more consumers buying console games. Stop stereotyping. Sweeping statements claiming that video games are naturally a male hobby deny people their individuality. Recognize that the reasons people make life-defining choices are complicated, so drop the jargon like self-selection and punching up. 
work against the strong negative social conditioning coming from outside gaming. It isn't fun to be a freak. Harassment targeted at anyone needs to be seen as unacceptable. Different rules based on gender lead to confusion. If it's not okay to say to a woman, it's not okay to say to anyone. No more trophy victims. Let women talk, don't talk for us. Drawing fire makes the trolling worse and men talking to men about sexism undermines the process of normalizing opinions that come from women. End the culture of extreme trash talk. Mature thinking people don't enjoy being around someone who is a constant fountain of gendered racial and sexual insults. Respect the limits of individuals. If someone asks you to stop doing something, don't freak out. Remember that we're all here to have fun and small changes for other people's comfort can make a huge difference. Focus on the accomplishments and passions of women in gaming, not just the horror stories. There, 10 things-ish that can promote more women in video games that have absolutely nothing to do with changing the contents of the games. The reason I didn't include game content is that games are too diverse to make sweeping generalizations about the content in them. No game is for everyone. Some games show women wonderfully. Some games, not so much. Even if some games are juvenile, hateful, or just plain dumb, available science says that it doesn't make people bigoted. So just don't play games you don't like. Don't cover games you don't like. Freedom of speech gives you the right to support the games you do like. So focus on them. There isn't even consensus among women regarding what specific things offend us. For some women, any sexualized scenario is offensive. Other women play Bioware games for the romances. For some women, large-chested women are the devil. For others, they're members of our families, or even ourselves. But games are diverse enough that different types of women can play different types of games. I think, however, that the majority of women can agree that we object to being given very narrow parameters for acceptability that huge numbers of women can never achieve. Swapping out busty blondes for athletic brunettes is the game girl of the moment, doesn't solve the problem of there being only one acceptable physical type of woman at any given time. And you notice, that type is never a non-white person. Different types of women should exist in games because different types of women exist in the world. It's that simple. Issues of representation are complex, but the starting point is that we need to stop screaming at each other and start listening to each other without looking to pounce at the first awkward terminology. People don't think rationally when they're scared, and they don't open themselves up to someone they think is looking for an opportunity to attack. So this series is my starting point. You've seen my efforts to outline the facts, present the truth of some theories, and offer my suggestions on how to start healing this rift. It's been 14 episodes, well over four hours and nine months. Every opinion, every joke, every goofy cat meme, and every word was put into this by me. My husband helped work the camera. He gets some credit too. <laughs> and of course, Momos. It also couldn't have been done without the people who generously supported me on Patreon. I'll do a financial wrap-up video specifically for those patrons, but I wanted to publicly say thanks because there's no way I could have done this any other way. You guys are the reason I was able to devote significant time to doing this. Hopefully this is just the beginning. To those of you who watched, especially those of you who may have started with a very negative view of feminism, I know you're out there. I saw your comments. Thanks for keeping an open mind. I'm not looking to convert anyone. I just wanted to present the actual theories and actual history, not the version that's been warped by activist agendas. At the end of the day, I'm a gamer. Being a woman shouldn't change the slightest bit of that identity. I believe that together we can change the gamer identity from a charge pejorative into a description of someone who really, really, really loves video games. And that's all. The gamer identity doesn't come with an appearance. We're all customizable characters. Thanks so much for watching, and make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel to get news of what's coming up next. You'll be hearing really soon. Once I get some sleep, start eating properly again, and generally be a human being for a little while, instead of a research and editing robot. Although robots are cool. Momo, well, you're pausing the mic. No. You gotta be on your shoulder, buddy. There we go. Being a woman shouldn't change the slightest bit of that identity. I believe that together, we can change the gamer identity from a charged... Okay, I'm almost done. To those of you who watched, especially those of you that may have started with a very negative view of feminism, I know you're out there. I saw your comments. Thanks oh, for... Oh. Two, what did you do three. to your head, buddy? What did you do to your head?
Why do you have a bald spot? And now Binky's here. Hi, Bink. I believe it together. Binky. That got him to go away. <laughs>